Gracious God, grant us the strength to seek the truth. Come whence it may, cost what it will. Amen. Amen. Be seated. If you uh, didn't have a chance to read the bulletin from St. Albans Church, let me take a moment to introduce myself to you today. My name is Luis Leon. Uh, my wife and I became members of uh, St. Of, of Albans Church uh, after I retired from being the rector at St. John's Lafayette Square in 2018. And we came and became members of the church. We are nine o'clockers, so you've seen us here at the nine o'clock service. We don't go to the eight o'clock or the 11.15, and we sit right over there. I see somebody's using our pew today, <laughs> and I'm not sure that that's a very good thing. But at any rate, uh, we come to the, nine, uh, to the nine o'clock service, and I'm delighted to, uh, delighted to be with you. Emily invited me to be the pinch hitter, guest preacher at St. Albans today. And, um, and then after she invited me, which I was glad to accept, uh, she said to me, now you have a couple of things you need to, re to do. And I said, what's, uh, what's my assignment? And she said, well, there are two things that need to happen during your sermon today. One of them is uh, that we're doing the B, uh, the B campaign for the diocese, which is... Uh, borrowing from Micah's sixth chapter of the eighth verse, that we want to be loving, to, uh, to be just, to be loving, uh, to be humble, and to be generous. And she said to me, your assignment is to talk about being humble. So when I told my wife that, she said to me, ooh, I'd like to hear that sermon, Louise. <laughs> She's the one that constantly reminds me. I said, you know, Luis, there's a very fine line between self-confidence and arrogance. And I'm never quite sure where you are on that very fine line. So that's, that, that's just to tell you, I don't know a lot about it. Um, and then she also said after that, she said, you're gonna talk about humility? I don't know anything about it. And she said, you also need to talk about financial stewardship and see if you can work that into your sermon. Well, I tried to work it into the humility thing I can't do it. So I'm going to give you two homilies this morning. Uh, one's about stu financial stewardship, and then I'm going to uh, basically throw some paper watts up on the wall and see what sticks up there uh, about humility, because I, like I said, I know very little about it. So can we focus, for, first of all, on, the, uh, uh, on, on financial stewardship? One of the things that we need to recognize, all of us have to recognize right off the bat, with, and I suspect that none of us can disagree, we have a very uh, complicated relationship with money, don't we? Uh, sometimes we value it too much, sometimes we don't value it enough. Now, let me tell you something, that I, I, I don't think money is bad. I, I really don't think that it has any ethics. I don't think it has any morality. Um, I came to this country in 1961 as a refugee from Cuba, and I want to tell you, we didn't have two nickels to rub together. And I never want to be in a situation again where I don't have two nickels to rub together. So I know how important it is to have some money to be able to take care of yourself, to take care of your family, to take care of your needs. I understand that completely. But we have a very complicated relationship with it. Notice that in the Episcopal Church, uh, in all of our prayers in the Episcopal Church, we always pray for the poor. We pray for those who are in hospitals. We pray for those who are in jail. We pray for those who are in trouble. All very good. You know who we never pray for? The rich. We never pray for the rich. Never. The only time that we ever have a prayer for the rich is uh, on Ash Wednesday. And the rest of the year, I guess the rich get off scot-free. I think that we should probably have a prayer every week at a place like St. Albans, which I belong and which I'm a part, so I'm pointing a finger at myself, that should go something like this. For all of those in, uh, in love with their assets, let us pray to the Lord. And all of us would have to say, Lord, have mercy upon us. Because I think that's a complicated relationship that we have with it. When I was the rector of St. John's Church and every other congregation where I served as rector, we would meet for a um, premarital conferences with couple getting to, marry, to get married, um, one of the things that they always came, they were always afraid I was going to ask them about their sex life. And I tried to calm them right off the bat, and I said, I don't care what you all do in the bedroom. I really don't care what you do in the bedroom. So we would review all sorts of other things, and we would finally get to what was really, really important, which I wanted them to address, and I wanted them to talk about before they got married. And I said, I want you to create a family budget that is going to be your budget when you get married. 
that you're going to look at all of your expenses and you're going to decide how you're going to use your income and your expenses and weigh them off against each other. And I would say, and I want you to examine your, your debts, uh, whether credit card debt or college debt, and when you get married, does, uh, do those debt become, remain my debts or are they our debts? And if you come with uh, an inheritance from your parents, are those assets my assets or are they our assets? So we went through all of that. And then I would ask him the most difficult one. I said, and I want you to do the budget, and I want you to bring it to me. I want you to show me what your family budget is going to be. Now, sometimes we would go meet a week later and no budget. And I would say, let me tell you something. You're not going to get married at St. John's Church. I'm not officiating at your wedding until I see your family budget. So I would say, now go on. Get out of here, and you come back when you've done your budget. So finally, they would come back and they would show me how they had balanced this and balanced that and how much money they took, blah, 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 blah. And there were two things that came to, came to mind. One, one thing really struck me was uh, how free and frequently did they include giving any money away? How frequently they did not include giving any money away? And I would always say to them, you know, I don't care if you pledge at St. John's Church, which was a bold lie. I really, I really wanted them to pledge at St. John's Church, but for the purpose of what I'm driving, I said, I don't care if you pledge to St. John's Church, but I want you to recognize that money is a very powerful instrument. And the question for all of our lives is this, will you have power over that powerful instrument, or will that powerful instrument have power over you? That's the question of all of our lives. Do you have power over that powerful instrument, or does that powerful instrument have power over you? And I would say to all of them, if you can't give any of your money away to somebody, to some institution, to some, something you care about, then you know that that powerful instrument has power over your life. It's the same question for all of us, isn't it? How we examine what we do with our money, especially when it comes to the every member canvas, the stu financial stewardship season. Capital campaigns are about giving to a need. The every member canvas is about the need to give. I don't want to emphasize about the need to give, our need to give, to understand that we have power over that powerful instrument. The biblical narratives are always talking about 10%. And whenever I talk about 10%, everybody puts their hand over their wallets or their hands over their purses. And I say, well, hold on just a moment. You know, that's what the Bible says. And you have to consider and say, well, why is it 10%? Well, because there was a lot back then. And guess what? It's a lot right now. And the question is not whether you give 10% or not. It's to examine your life in what the, the biblical narratives suggest for us to consider in giving away. I think that God wants us to believe in as much of God as we can believe in God at any given time and that that's good enough. And that then God wants us to move forward from where we are. I really believe that. I think we're all on a spiritual journey and part of that spiritual journey is determining what you're going to do with that powerful instrument. And the question for all of us during the Every Member Canvas is this. How much does faith allow me to give away? How much does faith allow me to give away? How much in response to God's grace, God's mercy, God's forgiveness, God's love, am I giving myself? How much will faith allow me to give? That's the real question for all of us, isn't it? And once you can give some of it away thoughtfully, with intention, then you know that you're moving on the way that you have power over that powerful instrument. And that powerful instrument doesn't have power over your life. But let's move on. I've got notes here. I swear I won't go on forever. And then Emily, the second task that Emily gave me was to talk about humility. Of course, you and I both know that this is a summary of uh, the sixth chapter, the eighth verse of the prophet Micah, who is the fourth of the four great prophets of the eighth century B.C. The first one's Amos, the second one's Hosea, the third one's Isaiah. Uh, Isaiah. And what he's doing is summarizing all three of those prophets. Amos, all about justice. Hosea, 
all about God's loving kindness. And Isaiah, all about servanthood. All three of them are there to do justice. To do, we need to remember this, that justice is not the same thing as charity. And in the church, the Episcopal church, we get that confused all the time. Uh, Walter Brueggemann wrote that uh, defining justice as uh, justice is uh, determining what belongs to whom and returning it to them, which is something for all of us to consider. And I think the task of the church is one, to be about charity, to meet human need, and B, to also examine the root of the problem that causes the need for charity. And every church should have a, a, a two paths to the same ministry, to seek justice as well as charity, but they're not to be confused. The second one, is, of course, is to love tenderly, to borrow from, uh, from, from, from Hosea. To love tenderly. From the Christian perspective, love is the name of the game, isn't it? Rene Descartes, Descartes wrote, Cogito ergo sum, I think therefore I am. From the Christian perspective, it's amo ergo sum. I love, therefore I am. Love is the, game of the, is the name of the game for us. And you and I both know that if we fail in love, we fail in everything else. And you and I both know this, that there is no smaller package than that of a person all wrapped up in him or herself. And we see that evidence all day long and every time that we get to the news. And then finally, we're to the humility. And as I said to you, I had to go read up on this subject because I didn't do too, too much about it. Uh, don't practice it, can't define it. Um, I think the hint here is that uh, Micah says to walk humbly with our God. I want to invite you to consider that the only way that you can walk with God is humbly. And if you walk humbly with God, you begin to understand that you're not the center of the universe. There's a Willie Nelson song, a country song that goes like this. Oh, Lord, it's hard to be humble when you're perfect in every way. <laughs> the most frequent photograph taken in the world is the selfie. It's all about me. It's all the focus on me, not recognizing that we are not the source of life, that we are not the source of mercy, we are not the source of love. We are not the source of justice. God is. And if we can maintain that relationship, perhaps, perhaps we can come up with our own definition of humble. If we can walk humbly with God, which is the only way to walk, we can begin to understand that. Richard Rohr, the uh, Franciscan monk that writes a column on a weekly basis as a meditation. Do you all read Richard Rohr? I know this is the Episcopal Church. I know it's nine o'clock in the morning, but I don't expect hallelujahs and I don't expect amens. But when I ask a question, I want your response. <laughs> Do you all read Richard Rohr? Yeah, well, thank you, thank you. And he had a column, thankfully. I thought to myself, the, uh, God has answered my prayer. He had a column two weeks ago, one of his meditation was on humility. And I said, thank you, Jesus, I've got my topic done. And one of the things that he suggests is this, that to be humble and start talking about humility is you can't have the answers. You cannot have the answers, Richard Rohr says. More importantly is seeking the questions. More importantly is engaging with people seeking the questions. And if you get into the answer thing, then you start thinking very highly of yourself and you think you know it all and you think that you command everything about you. And I was reading that, and again, it was kind of like pointing a finger at me, and I said, oh, Lord, I'm in a heap of trouble right here, and I need to ask for God's mercy. So that's the first suggestion. Uh, the second one is this, that, you know, Jesus couldn't stand spiritual arrogance. That's why he was always, uh, you look kindly on the prostitutes and everybody else, as opposed to all of the Pharisees. He just couldn't stand spiritual arrogance, could he? That's why he uh, talked about the prodigal son, you know, the spiritual arrogance of this prodigal son just had no appeal for him. 
The spiritual arrogance of the tax collector, the righteous person, had no appeal for him. I mean, of the Pharisees, not the tax collector. And it went on down the road. You know, Jesus loved and invites us to love as Jesus loved, which is looking at everyone as a unit of God's grace. Unprecedented, irrepeatable, and irreplaceable. And that's what we're invited to do. Not to look down on anybody, but to look at them as an equal. You know, that spiritual arrogance can get us into a, just a whole heap of trouble. So I think for all of us, as we think about how do we walk humbly with God, we need to examine for ourselves about our own sense of spiritual arrogance. And then finally, let me finish out. Uh, there's a wonderful story that takes place at the end of World War II, and it's between the Governor General of Java, the Dutch Indies of Java, and he's talking to Lauren Vanderpost. And after the end of World War II, you know, the Indonesians wanted their own independence. They wanted the Dutch out of there. So the Governor General talking to Lawrence Vanderpost says, you know, I can't believe they want us out of here. I can't believe that all the things that we've done for them, we've created roads, we've brought hospitals, we eradicated mal malaria, we've done all these things, and we've done all these things. For them. Why do they want us out of these islands? And Lawrence Vanderpost says to him, it's perhaps because we didn't have the right look in our eyes. My invitation to you as you think how to walk humbly with God is what's the look in our eyes when we confront somebody else? Especially those who serve us. You know, when I lived in Wilmington, Delaware, we lived in a house that was built in 1905, a beautiful house, and the big stairways were right at the center of the house, and you went upstairs to the bedrooms, and then when you got to the kitchen, there was another set of stairs, much narrower, that went bending along the way like this. And that was for the servant, who were always carrying the heavy load. And I always thought to myself, well, what does it say about us? What does that say about us? And in our public lives, there's been a small change in the language that we use. When people work for the government, we tend to refer to them now as public officials. In the old days, we used to call them public servants. And that very small change, I think, helps to define how people see themselves. What's the look in your eye when you see somebody who is not of the same level of income, the same level of education, the same level of all the things that how we measure these things? And if you can examine that at some level or another, you begin to understand how we can all walk humbly with our God. Let me finish with a prayer. It's written by Reinhold Niebuhr, who was a theologian of the uh, last century, one of my favorite theologians. And whenever my wife reminds me about that fine line uh, between arrogance and self-confidence, I go back up to my little office up in the fourth floor and I read this prayer, which I offer for your consideration. This is Reinhold Niebuhr. Nothing that is worth doing can be achieved in our lifetime, therefore we must be saved by hope. Nothing which is true or beautiful or good makes complete sense in any immediate context of history, therefore we must be saved by faith. Nothing we do, however virtuous, can be accomplished alone, therefore we are saved by love. No virtuous act is quite as virtuous from the standpoint of our friend or foe as it is from our standpoint. Therefore, we must be saved by the final form of love, which is forgiveness. Amen.